Thanks very much. Um, I'd first like to add my thanks to Ben and Lindy and the amazing local organizing team here. The conference is going so beautifully. It's thanks to all their hard work. Um, and I'd also want to call out Ben and Lindy and the rest of the Health Law Research Center here at QUT. It is an absolute gem, and I hope you treasure it. So. End of life law, ethics, policy, and practice. The universe before us at this conference encompasses the withholding, withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment, palliative care and terminal sedation, euthanasia and assisted suicide, and the determination of death and organ and tissue donation. The galaxy of the withholding and withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment encompasses challenging questions about concepts, treatments, patients, and decisions. Is there a difference between withholding and withdrawal? Is there a difference between withholding and withdrawal and voluntary euthanasia and assisted suicide? What can be withheld or withdrawn? Only advanced life support or also dialysis, antibiotics, artificial hydration and nutrition, oral hydration and nutrition? From whom can treatment be withheld or withdrawn? Only adults or also minors? Only competent or also previously competent, not yet competent, or never competent patients as well? Who decides what can be withheld or withdrawn and when? Through what processes must decisions about withholding and withdrawal be made? The solar system of decisions encompasses decision-making authority and decision-making processes, including information disclosure, advanced care planning, and conflict resolution. The planet upon which I come to rest for this particular session is that of unilateral withholding and withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment. Who decides? And the country I will focus most on is Australia. So a quick word on terminology before we really get down to it, as it's critical that we're all talking about the same thing, working with the same definitions of the key terms as we get to the heart of this question. So for the purposes of this session, I use the following terms with the following meanings. The withholding of potentially life-sustaining treatment means not starting treatment that has the potential to sustain the life of a person. Withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment means stopping treatment that has the potential to sustain the life of a person. And unilateral means without the consent or authorization of the patient or the patient's substitute decision maker. So with that sorted, let's get to it. Let me first provide you with four context setting pieces. A review of what we know about unilateral withholding and withdrawal of treatment, that it's happening, that it's controversial, that it's being challenged, and that it isn't being approached in law the same way everywhere. I'll then take Australia as a case study with respect to what we should do about this state of affairs, describing a process that I think is better for seeking law reform than the recourse to litigation or responding at the level of individual cases and institutional policy, which have been the dominant approaches in my country, and we are not alone. And I'll describe the rest of the result of following this alternative process for Australia. I do this for two reasons. First, to make the case for law reform in a particular direction for Australia, given that this is where we are sitting and given that there is so much interest in this topic here. Second, I do it to provide a model of what I believe to be a useful strategy for approaching law reform for the rest of us, i.e. the non-Aussies here, with an eye to persuading you to go home from this conference and try to work through the steps of this process and lead the charge on whatever reforms are necessary for law, policy, practice in your home country. So what do we know? Well, it's happening. I can say with confidence that all around the world, potentially life-sustaining treatment is being withheld or withdrawn without the knowledge of or against the wishes of patients and their substitute decision makers. Unilateral withholding and withdrawal is happening. Here are a few revealing numbers. Withholding or withdrawal of treatment without telling the patient or the patient's family. We see 80% where the physician thought treatment was futile, 50%, 32%, 23%. These are just sampling of studies from around the world. Uh, clearly, it is happening. Clearly, unilateral withholding and withdrawal is also very controversial. Literature searches on PubMed instantly got 2,000 articles on the topic, and they were from across a multiple of, multitude of disciplines and from around the world. Media coverage of these cases is extensive, 
For example, you search on Google for Rizzuli in Canada, you'll get 60,000 results. You type in Betancourt and Futility, the American case, you get over 850,000 hits. And, it, and it, in this conference, too, it looks like at least 10% of the presentations in the concurrent sessions are on the topic of unilateral withholding or withdrawal of treatment. We also know that conflicts over unilateral withholding and withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment are ending up in front of courts and tribunals. Just a few numbers. Since 2003, there have been 38 cases involving unilateral withholding and withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment referred to the Ontario Consent and Capacity Board in Canada. Since 1991, there have been 27 cases before Canadian courts. By 2007, and so the number will be much higher now, nearly 100 unilateral cases had gone before the courts in the United States. Since 2009, there have been 11 cases involving conflicts over unilateral withholding and withdrawal decided by the Court of Protection under the Mental Capacity Act in the United Kingdom. Other countries have also seen court challenges. In short, there is litigation on this issue around the world. Now, not surprisingly, the legal status of unilateral withholding and withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment is not the same the world over, both in terms of the source and the content of that status. In the United Kingdom, through both specific legislation and comprehensive and high-level judicial decisions, decision-making authority rests with the physician. It is the physician who has the authority to determine whether treatment is in the patient's best interests. And best interests is understood to include not just medical, but also social, psychological, and moral matters. It includes the patient's wishes and feelings, beliefs and values, or the things that were important to him. The process of the physician determining what is in the patient's best interest is that the physician must use professional skills to make determinations, must encourage the person to participate, consider the person's past and present wishes and feelings and beliefs and values, relevant factors, must take into account views of others engaged in caring for the person or interested in his welfare, consult with the patient or his family, and try to put themselves in the place of the patient. The onus in the face of conflict between the physician and the patient substitute decision maker is on the substitute decision maker who can take the challenge to the court of protection. In New Zealand, through a review of a fairly sparse body of case law, one can conclude that decision making authority rests with physicians where treatment is futile and the approach being taken by the physician is in line with good medical practice. Consultation with the patient substitute decision maker is required, but consent is not. As in the UK, the onus in the face of conflict with the physician is on the substitute decision maker to challenge in court. However, there does remain some ambiguity in New Zealand about the need for substitute decision makers' consent where treatment is already being provided, i.e. withdrawal versus withholding. There's some variability across jurisdictions in the United States, and we had a whole session on that this morning. Some state statutes permit some unilateral withholding and withdrawal of potentially life-sustaining treatment. Under, for example, the Uniform Healthcare Decisions Act, the physician must communicate and attempt to transfer, but can withhold or withdraw where he or she considers the treatment to be medically ineffective, where provision would be against his or her conscience, or where treatment works contrary to generally accepted medical standards. And this position, this act has been embraced in a number of states. Some other states have legislation that is less permissive of unilateral than the HCDA, but still do permit some unilateral withholding and withdrawal. But the possibility of civil, criminal, or disciplinary sanctions for unilateral withholding and withdrawal remains in still other states. Under legislation in Ontario, a province in Canada, physicians do not have the authority to unilaterally withhold or withdraw potentially life-sustaining treatment. They must go to the Consent and Capacity Board if the substitute decision maker refuses to consent to withholding or withdrawal. However, it is unsettled law whether physicians have authority for unilateral decision making in the rest of Canada. Some cases say yes, some say no, some are silent, some never get to the decision because the patient dies. We've had a significant number of court cases and hope that the inconsistent responses from the lower courts would be resolved when the Supreme Court of Canada heard the Rizzuli case. However, the majority of the court in Rizzoli based its decision solely on an interpretation of the Ontario legislation. And so it didn't resolve the uncertainty in the common law and didn't help the rest of us. The law in Ontario is now relatively clear. 
but without legislation addressing the issue, the rest of the country remains in a state of confusion and controversy. In sum, there is a range of approaches to the legal status of unilateral withholding and withdrawal in a variety of countries, from clearly permitted through to clearly prohibited, with a mix of confusion and uncertainty in the middle. Some have addressed the issue directly in legislation, others in comprehensive analyses in the courts, still others in brief and not always consistent judicial decisions. Still others have nothing. So I know that some, and suspect that lots of us, need significant reform uh, in terms of law policy and practice. Practice doesn't align with law, the law doesn't align with ethics, and so on. So what should we do? Well, in this next part of my presentation, I want to suggest an alternative path for seeking reform to describe the steps in a process through the illustrative lens of some work that I recently completed with Ben White and Lindy Wilmot. And I hasten to say that anything you like, you can credit to them. And anything you don't like in what I say, you can assume was just me going rogue. They, don't, they, they didn't agree with it, and I just went off on my own little lark. Um, as noted earlier, I do this for two reasons. First, to present an argument for specific law reform here in Australia. And second, to encourage the rest of us to work together, sharing across sectors, disciplines, and borders, as we are here at this conference, toward a common goal of ensuring the best possible care of the dying when we return home. So the steps of the proposed process are as follows. Identify the values that are at stake. Articulate how these values are expressed in the specific legal system. Review the legal landscape. Then hold the law to the values and then develop law reform as needed. So let's look at what happens when one works through this process in Australia. When doctors and patients, or their substitute decision makers, disagree on whether treatment should be provided, it's critical to, to have laws and policies in place that can resolve the impasse. To evaluate existing and to design new laws and policies, it's necessary to take a step back and consider the values that are implicated in and should ground a law and policy response to the issue at hand. The core values at stake in the context of unilateral withholding and withdrawal, potentially life-sustaining treatment, are, I would argue, the following. Life, autonomy, equality, the rule of law, distributive justice, procedural fairness, access to justice, and conscience. Looking at the law that governs end-of-life decision-making and the general principles that underpin the broader legal system, it can be concluded that all of these values are embraced by and embedded in the Australian legal system. Let's look at each of these in turn. Australian courts have recognized the state's interest in protecting, <coughs> preserving human life. However, life is not seen as an absolute value. The law in Australia also recognizes that the value of an individual's life can sometimes be outweighed by the disvalue of their suffering or the value of protecting and promoting their autonomy. In other words, a person may decide that life is no longer worth living. In addition, the law in Australia recognizes that the value of an individual's life can sometimes be outweighed by the value of respecting their autonomy. The principle of respect for autonomy is also a fundamental part of Australian common law. The courts have recognized the common law principle of autonomy and self-determination, and also noted that the principle is well established at common law. Now, of course, the concept of autonomy has many different meanings. Autonomy has generally been talked about in Australian law as the narrow right to prevent physical interference with one's bodily integrity. This is what drives the position that a refusal of treatment must be respected at law. A wider view, a right to self-determination, involves having one's will respected and acted upon and would include the ability to determine that one receive particular treatment. I would argue that it's reasonable to, cl reasonable to claim that this latter view of autonomy is actually behind Australian law and that this would be recognized by the courts if confronted with a proper case. The narrow interpretation to date may just be a function of the cases before the courts being refusals of treatment and therefore only requiring the narrow interpretation in order to come to a result. And the broader interpretation might be articulated by the courts in an appropriate case because first, autonomy is increasingly seen as a critical core value and the broad view is necessary to to, for it even to have a role in respect of this issue. And second, an exclusively narrow view leads one to some absurd conclusions, for example, that consent is not required for behavioral modification. It must also be noted here that autonomy is not an absolute value. It can be outweighed by harms to others. Think, for example, of the values of distributive justice, equality, and conscience. <coughs> 
Now, the legal landscape in Australia demonstrates its commitment to the value of equality. Australia is a signatory to various conventions and treaties, including the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which support and promote the value of equality. It has also enacted human rights and anti-discrimination legislation. And these instruments aim not only to prevent discrimination against people with disabilities, but they also strive to ensure such individuals receive the same standard of health care as the able-bodied. They also prohibit discrimination on the basis of race and culture. Underpinning such prohibitions is a recognition of racial and cultural diversity within Australia and the need for Australian society to accept and respect such diversity. A fundamental plank of the legal system on Australia is adherence to the rule of law. There's no universal definition of the rule of law, but the Law Council of Australia has identified a number of key principles, which together articulate its understanding of the rule of law. And the first of these principles states that the law must be both readily known and available and certain and clear. Recognized threats to the rule of law include uncertainty, complexity, inconsistency, and lack of transparency. For example, if after reasonable investigation and analysis of the law, it is not possible to determine what legal rights and duties arise, then the state of the law offends the rule of law. Some of you will know where I'm going with this, having read some of the law around unilateral withholding withdrawal in Australia. Um, resources of all descriptions, including intensive care unit beds, dialysis units, organs for transplant, are in limited supply. And there will be times when giving or continuing treatment for one patient means that one or more patients do not get treatment. In addition, a dollar spent on health care may mean one less dollar spent on other forms of social services. We should not, however, hide from this fact. And in Australian law, it is not illegal to ration resources. It happens frequently, and it is necessary. No country can afford to provide all that is medically possible to everyone. Indeed, the law is an institution that distributes a range of valuable goods and burdens across society. It can be legally defensible to deny treatment to some individuals. That said, the allocation must be done in a manner consistent with the values of the legal system. In other words, the law accepts the need for the value of distributive justice. For our purposes today, the other values discussed will give content to the concept of distributive justice. It's clear that under Australian law, the allocation of scarce resources and limitations on rights and freedoms require procedural fairness. For law and policy making, this means that laws and policies must be drafted in an open and transparent fashion with input from individuals and groups with the necessary expertise, with a broad understanding of expertise, including experiential knowledge. Particularly careful attention must be paid to include the perspective of the very individuals who are most likely to be denied treatment or to have their rights or freedoms limited on the basis of the policies. Furthermore, given the commitment to the value of equality discussed earlier, any laws or policies must be subjected to rigorous equality-based analysis prior to approval. Further, once these laws and policies are established, they must be challengeable in the courts or other adjudicative bodies, for example, for being discriminatory. With respect to individual decisions about allocating resources or limiting rights and freedoms, procedural fairness requires adherence to the hearing role. Broadly, the hearing role requires that a person has adequate notice of a decision that is proposed to be made, access to relevant information, and sufficient time to consider it and an opportunity to participate in the decision-making process and to be heard. The rule of law already identified as a key value in the Australian legal system depends in part on individuals having access to justice when they feel their legal rights and freedoms or those of a loved one have been infringed. Threats to access to justice include knowledge imbalances, power imbalances, high-cost dispute resolution mechanisms, and slow dispute resolution mechanisms. Both the values of access to justice and the recognition of the threats to it are reflected in the Australian legal system through the trend toward the establishment of tribunals and in the very language of the legislation establishing these tribunals. The final value is conscience. An individual's freedom of conscience is recognized in Australian law through, for example, its embrace of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. However, the law is often called upon and does balance the freedom of conscience of one person as against that of another, for example, a doctor as against a patient. In addition, as with the values of life, autonomy, and equality, the value of conscience is not an absolute value and can be outweighed by other values. Now, before turning to 
the, uh, sorry, before turning from the description of the place of the core values in Australian law, at this point a summary of the legal status of unilateral withholding and withdrawal is necessary, a very brief one. The sources of relevant obligations for physicians here are both the criminal and the civil law regimes. The criminal law imposes a duty upon a person, in this context a doctor, who voluntarily assumes responsibility for another who is unable to care for themselves due to mental or physical incapacity. In such a case, the doctor has a duty to provide the other with the necessaries of life. Necessaries of life can include medical treatment, so criminal sanction could potentially attach to not providing treatment. The civil law also imposes a duty on doctors to use reasonable care and skill when making treatment decisions in relation to patients. And this arises from the general law of negligence. Where medical treatment is needed to keep a patient alive, reasonable care will often dictate the provision of treatment. Withholding or withdrawing potentially life-sustaining treatment can, can thus give rise to a breach of this civil duty if doing so falls short of exercising reasonable care and skill. The assessment of medical treatment as futile in a given case will alter the criminal and civil law obligations just mentioned. The courts have consistently held that where treatment is assessed as futile, a doctor is not under a duty to provide the medical treatment. There have been two bases for arriving at this conclusion. The first is that futile treatment will be treatment that is not in a patient's best interest. Accordingly, if the court agrees with the doctor's assessment of futility, it will not interfere with the doctor's treatment of the patient by requiring that treatment be provided. The second basis is that stopping or not providing futile treatment will not constitute a breach of the criminal law duty to provide necessaries of life. So the bottom line with respect to the law on unilateral withholding and withdrawal in Australia is that there's no general duty on doctors to provide treatment they consider to be futile. Doctors do not need consent from the patient or his or her substitute decision maker or any other authorization to withhold or withdraw treatment they consider to be futile. Furthermore, decision making authority and determination of futility and best interests all rest with doctors, reviewable by the courts, but resting with doctors. And the onus is on the substitute decision maker to challenge the physician's decision rather than vice versa. This is all except in Queensland where the Guardianship and Administration Act of 2000 requires consent from a substitute decision maker or some other authority before a doctor can withhold or withdraw futile treatment. So now we're set up to consider how the current law holds up in light of those core values I outlined. The current law respects and promotes the value of life. There is a duty to provide treatment in a patient's best interests and a requirement to provide the necessaries of life. The law also recognizes that the, that the value of life is not absolute. It recognizes the right of a competent individual to refuse treatment, even where the consequence of that refusal is death. To some extent, the current law also respects and promotes the value of access to justice. Disputes that may arise regarding treatment are increasingly being decided by tribunals and boards pursuant to guardianship legislation. This guardianship system is expressly designed to resolve matters in a timely, informal, and inexpensive fashion. While there are some strengths, though, there are far more weaknesses. These include uncertainty, complexity, and inconsistency problems, conceptual problems, role problems, onus problems, and the covert allocation of health resources. In sum, the current law does not, hold up we does not do well when it's held up to the core values. So let's look at some of these. Uncertainty. There's considerable uncertainty in the law. For example, will compliance with good medical practice be recognized as a lawful excuse by Australian courts? It is in New Zealand, um, but it would be odd in code states in particular here to have a defense not set out in the code or in legislation. Now, the uncertainty in the law is not surprising given the fact that the law is developing in a patchwork way through litigation rather than legislation as it, as it developed in the United Kingdom and in Ontario. And no court has taken up the challenge of articulating a comprehensive approach to this issue, as has now happened in the UK. The law is also avoidably complex. Multiple legal bases have been used to justify the position that doctors are not obliged to provide treatment that is futile. For example, such treatment's not in the patient's best interests, or criminal liability doesn't attach because either futile treatment is not a necessary of life, or perhaps because the non-provision represents a good medical practice and is therefore lawful. The law is also inconsistent. So for example, in Queensland, 
Doctors may withhold or withdraw under the common law for adults with capacity and children, but other guardianship legislation consent requires it, sorry, requires consent when the decision relates to futile treatment for an adult who lacks capacity. Again, none of this is surprising given the reliance on court challenges as opposed to legislation. Clearly here, the value rule of law is compromised. There are also conceptual problems with the current law. Consider the concept of futility. It has a multitude of definitions. Dozens of different definitions can be found in the academic literature. To pick but a few examples to show you the range, uh, it could mean treatment will not lead to 10 minutes survival, 60 days survival, discharge from hospital. It might mean a specific level of quality of life or a percentage chance of success. And the fight about the definitions seems unresolvable more than 20 years after the first punches were thrown. The Australian case law also offers, either explicitly or implicitly, many different definitions. Now consider, too, the concept of necessaries of life. This has been the subject of contorted, contrived, and incoherent definitions. A review of the cases suggests that judges have wanted to be able to say that unilateral withholding or withdrawal is not unlawful, but have run up against the provisions imposing duties, on, duties to others as a potential barrier to that result. To circumvent this barrier, necessaries of life, has been defined so as to allow the withholding or withdrawal of treatment that doctors, and often doctors and the families, would agree to. But in doing the work through the definition of necessaries of life, common sense has been left behind. Some have ended up calling treatment that a number of people would want to be supported in wanting not a necessary of life. For example, on a definition adopted by an Australian court, ventilation in the following situation would not constitute a necessary of life. A woman with Guillain-Barre syndrome disease or post-polio syndrome who requires a ventilator to live will not have her disease or syndrome cured by the ventilation, will never recover from her illness, but who wishes to live and with the help of the ventilator could live a happy and fulfilling life for 10 years. Her ventilator would not count as a necessary of life under the definition. Again, the rule of law is compromised here. Rule problems. I'd argue here that the current law exhibits undue deference to doctors as arbiters of futility and best interests. Doctors' expertise is clinical, and yet they can be wrong on clinical grounds. Considerable prognostic uncertainty in end-of-life care has been widely recognized. For example, the capacity of severity scoring systems to accurately predict outcomes in individuals is debatable. Furthermore, doctors can be biased in their exercise of clinical judgment in favor of a dominant medical model. And yet that model may not, in fact, be right, or be right in that circumstance. Even more significantly, best interest assessments clearly go beyond the clinical. Doctors are actually required by the law to go beyond the clinical. They are called upon to consider medical as well as social, psychological, and moral matters. And yet they do not, by virtue of being doctors, have social or moral expertise. Furthermore, some physicians have been shown to have a bias against disability. Doctors are also required by the law to take into account the patient's wishes and feelings, beliefs and values are the things that were important to him. Yet doctors frequently have less knowledge of patients' wishes, feelings, beliefs and values than others. Doctors also demonstrably do go beyond the clinical. There is evidence, for instance, of religious affiliation and religiosity impacting on rates of withdrawal and li of life-sustaining treatment. If the decision-making was purely clinical, then the doctor's religion would have no impact. And yet it does. The current framework that assigns doctors the role of decision makers regarding whether or not treatment should be provided offends many of the values discussed earlier. Respect for a person's autonomy demands that he or she should make decisions about the treatment, as the patient or the substitute decision maker is in a better position to know what treatment he or she wants or would want. As decision maker, the doctor's conscience is privileged over the patient's or the substitute decision maker's conscience. Depending on the approach taken by the individual doctors, the value of procedural fairness could be compromised. A decision about treatment that is made by a doctor without consultation with the patient or substitute decision maker, or a consultation which occurs without comprehensive and effective disclosure of relevant information and treatment options, will offend the value of procedural fairness. And a doctor who makes a decision that treatment should not be provided to a person with a disability on the basis of his or her own quality of life assessment may offend the value of equality. We can here see in the deference to doctors a compromise on the values of autonomy, 
conscience, procedural fairness, and equality. And the current law puts the onus on families for invoking dispute resolution mechanisms. And this is problematic for a number of reasons. Families may not even know that treatment is being withheld or withdrawn, so may not know that there is a decision to challenge. They may not know that they can challenge a doctor's decision. And they may not feel able to do so in light of the power imbalance between them and the doctor. The values of procedural fairness and access to justice are thus compromised. The current approach to the law also puts the onus for making law on the courts instead of parliament. And yet this is less than ideal. Court cases, unlike parliamentary action, require making law in crisis mode. This does not allow adequate time for preparation and the development and expertise, exercise of expertise for lawyers. It does not allow adequate time for decision making by judges, especially when they are being asked to make law rather than simply apply established law to specific facts. And it places the burden on families of individual patients rather than on the institution of parliament. So the values compromised here are the rule of law and access to justice. Finally, for the most part, the law asks doctors to make individual treatment decisions based on a patient's best interests without considering resource allocation issues. However, we know that this is not what always happens. Doctors in charge of departments with limited beds, for example, intensive care units, make resource allocation decisions. Sometimes these decisions are dressed up as decisions grounded in conclusions about the futile nature of the treatment, with a denial that there is any rationing going on. However, except where the treatment is not able to help a patient, that is, treatment will not work, there may be a resource allocation component to the decision. And the problem is that the current system of regulation has not yet properly addressed the intersection of the specific issue of treatment of individual patients and the broader systemic issue of the allocation of scarce health resources. So the current system fails to ensure that sp health resources are distributed in a fair way. And if we accept that resourcing decisions are being made by doctors and those decisions affect patient treatment, the system also offends the values of procedural fairness and transparency of decision making, hence the rule of law. So from my comments so far, it will be clear uh, that I favor a change to the law. I would argue that a doctor should not be able to withhold or withdraw unilaterally on the basis of his or her opinion that treatment is futile or not in the best interest of the patient. And while the foundations of the proposed approach have been implied by the allocution of the values of the legal system, in this section I'll specifically articulate the elements of the proposed model. The first point to be made here is that I propose that reform should occur by way of statute. This would avoid the deficiencies outlined above which arise when laws develop through the courts. A comprehensive legislative model is preferable from both a rule of law and access to justice perspectives. Courts and tribunals would continue to have a role in resolving disputes about what should be done in the face of conflict in particular cases, but they should be asked to apply rather than make the law. A shift in decision-making power. At the heart of this proposed alternative model is a shift of decision-making power from doctors to the patient or his or her substitute decision-maker. This authority to decide is qualified as will be seen in a few moments, and can be challenged. But it represents a starting point as to who has the authority to make a decision about treatment or non-treatment. Such an approach gives better effect to the values of life and autonomy. Decisions about medical treatment begin with the patient, particularly where the proposed treat decision is to stop treatment, leading to his or her death. This model also better advances the value of equality, as it imposes a barrier to doctors inappropriately determining a life is not worthwhile based on considerations such as age or disability or that treatment is not worthwhile or effective based on different cultural beliefs or values. The proposed model also establishes a legal process that promotes the values of procedural fairness and access to justice. By locating the decision-making power with the patient and substitute decision-maker, a doctor and the health system need to engage with them in making decisions and a doctor is prevented from unilaterally deciding to stop or not start treatment. Entrenching this process in the law requires the provision of information, discussion with a patient about possible treatment options, and transparent decision making, hence procedural fairness. It places the burden of challenging a decision about the provision of treatment on those who can best carry it, namely the doctors and the healthcare system, hence access to justice. It embeds in the decision-making process appropriate recognition and a role for non-clinical values, 
and limits the role of medicine and doctors accordingly. Hence, protecting and promoting autonomy, conscience, procedural fairness, equality, and access to justice. As noted above, the patient or substitute decision maker's authority to decide about treatment is qualified, specifically to treatment that can work and for which there is no lawful excuse for the doctor not to provide. So the starting point is that doctors should continue to have an obligation to provide patients with the necessaries of life, and patients should be able to request treatment that fits within this category. The term necessaries of life is defined in a common sense, factual manner to mean simply treatment that is necessary to sustain life. If treatment is capable of sustaining life, it will be a necessary of life regardless of whether you, I, or the doctor might think it is not worth doing. This avoids sophistry and the lawfulness of a non-treatment decision turning on subjective decisions uh, by doctors. And so it advances the value of the rule of law. This also means that there will be a duty to provide a wide range, wider range of treatments than presently is the case. But it should be emphasized, there will not be a duty to provide all treatment. Treatment that will not work, such as antibiotics for a virus, will not be a necessary of life. They're not capable of sustaining life. This means there will be no duty to provide such treatment, and a patient or substitute decision maker will not be able to lawfully require that it be given. But what of the remaining treatments that would constitute a necessary of life? Can a patient or substitute decision maker always request such treatment, and must a doctor always provide it? You'll be relieved to know I'm about to say absolutely not. There are circumstances in which a doctor is not obliged to provide necessaries of life, and these should be clearly articulated. The circumstances would provide the doctor with a lawful excuse for not providing treatment. The following circumstances are, I believe, on the values discussed earlier, defensible. First, a doctor should be excused for not providing treatment if after consultation with the patient or legally authorized substitute decision maker, consent is given to withhold or withdraw the treatment. This excuse should also extend to consent contained in a valid advance directive or to a court order or tribunal decision. Earlier in my presentation, I noted that imposing limits on when treatment can be provided can be consistent with the value of distributive justice. Rationing of healthcare is inevitable and ethically appropriate. However, I have argued it must be done overtly, not covertly, and it needs to happen through a process that reflects such values as equality and procedural fairness. Rationing may need to, be, to occur both at a governmental level through enactment of legislation or development of departmental policies. It may also occur at the institutional level through hospitals developing policies that are specifically tailored to their own circumstances. This will no doubt be challenging. Broad and meaningful consultation is necessary as is ensuring that the composition of any drafting team is representative of the stakeholders, particularly those who are most likely to be adversely affected by the policies. Yet such an exercise is critical to develop a reasoned, coherent, ethical, and just response to this vexed issue. Regardless of the mechanism used, the statutes and policies need to be developed in a manner and with the result that they are consistent with the values identified above. Doctors should be excused for not providing treatment pursuant to such legislation or policies. Finally, there may be some situations in which treatment is a physical impossibility. For example, there may be no dialysis machine or oncology services in the town that the person lives in. A doctor shouldn't be liable for not providing the necessaries of life where it's not physically possible to do so. It's likely that such conduct would not be unlawful in any event, uh, even without an excuse as civil and criminal liability is as a rule not uh, imposed for failing to do something which is impossible. But for the sake of clarity and completeness, uh, this should still be specifically included in the legislation uh, as providing a lawful excuse for non-treatment. And the value of enabling a doctor to act in accordance with his or her conscience was recognized earlier. A doctor should not be required to provide treatment to a patient if treatment is contrary to his or her conscience, as long as it is possible to transfer the patient to a doctor willing and able to provide that treatment. However, if transfer is not possible, the treatment should continue until there is some other lawful excuse to not provide care. Now the values reflected in this proposed alternative model are life, autonomy, equality, rule of law, distributive justice, procedural fairness, access to justice, and conscience. Therefore, I would argue it better reflects, represents, and promotes the values of the Australian legal system than does the current law. I'd like before closing to issue a parting challenge. I'd like to ask you when you go home to sit down and articulate how the core values that I 
delineated at the beginning, are expressed in your specific legal system. Review the legal landscape around unilateral withholding and withdrawal. Hold your law up to the values and work to the reform the law as needed. And finally, share your results. Because comparative work in this domain is profoundly revealing and helpful. Now, I have no doubt that this proposal will generate considerable disagreement. <laughs> Take a drink. Uh, but fortunately, we're in a perfect space for collective reflection on it and on other possibilities. And on that optimistic note, I open the floor to you for questions, comments, and discussion. Thank you, Jocelyn. Do we have people question? If you'd like to use the mic at the front, thank you. Um, my question, uh, Jocelyn, as an Australian who is an, a political activist, is that perhaps you don't know that uh, the Australian legal system is under threat by several recent government changes, hence my T-shirt. <laughs> I will be marching on the 30th of August with uh, many other people on that day and on the 31st of August around the country seeking a better government at all levels. Um, I think several of the rules of law that you have uh, illustrated are under threat, have been under threat. Uh, there's, there seem to be several mooted changes to our Racial Discrimination Act, uh, uh, treatment of people with disabilities, the defunding of uh, legal services for uh, indigenous people, and so on, uh, apart from the egregious treatment of our asylum seekers and <coughs> potential refugees against all the uh, international covenants that we purport to represent. So two, two, two things to say back to that. Advocacy, I applaud. And so while I won't be in the country to go march with you, um, I, I applaud the marching. The second is to say the fact that there, there are all these threats doesn't mean we don't do the work that I've outlined. Because one of the things I've come to realize is you do all the kind of work that I just laid out you, that, that you could do for your jurisdiction, even when it looks like all doors and windows are closed and locked. Because you never know when that window of political opportunity for legislative reform is going to open. And you have to be ready to go through it really quickly. Because if when it opens, you suddenly say, oh, now let's do that. Remember, Jocelyn was talking about a process and how we'll work through our values. And by the time you do that, that window is shut. So, so engage, but also I would say get ready for when you have the opportunity to make change to the law. Thanks, Jocelyn. On your last slide uh, that you had the proposed alternative approach, you, you make the point about um, as something being capable of sustaining life and something that will not work or an activity that will not work. So in, in advanced medicine in ICU, you can do amazing things to continue to successfully keep somebody's life present. What goal are you trying to approach there? So is it, is it just keeping someone alive or is there a particular goal around the quality or the benefit of that life? So we, we could continue to do I mean, this is a silly example, but uh, open somebody's chest and make sure that there's an external pump that's pumping somebody's heart to keep them alive. So is that contemplated within the rubric of necessary for life? No, because what is critical is the assessment of the quality of life that follows on. So it's not just life for life's sake. It's, it's life for the instrumental value that it gives the person who has it. And then the question is, who gets to decide whether that life has instrumental value for that person? And I'm arguing it's not doctors. Because the whole, that, that, that is the point, which is to say, the debate here where you're having conflict is usually about where people are thinking that treatment is not worth doing. I think that is absolutely a part of the decision-making process, and I want to displace doctors as the decision-makers about whether, whether treatment is worth doing. Because I think whether it's worth doing depends upon the uh, wishes of the individual and the assessment of what is in their best interests, neither of which physicians are best situated to answer that question. So it's not going to result. People say, oh, you know, ICUs are just going to be completely full and nobody will be stopping treatment. So that's just actually, that's not the consequence of taking this kind of approach. 
uh, because most people will refuse treatment at the end. This is for that small percentage where they want to continue where the healthcare providers don't want. And there will be ways in which we will sometimes still say, even if you want it, even if we've moved the decision-making authority over to the patient as a substitute decision-maker, we're, we're valuing autonomy, we're prioritizing autonomy, we're saying all this, we still may as a society say, we can't afford to give you that treatment. And there's nothing illegitimate about that. What's illegitimate is if the decision-making is happening in the shadows at the bedside, instead of society saying, under these kinds of circumstances, we can't provide treatment. So even if you want it, even if you or your substitute decision maker ask for it, you won't get it. But it's because those are challengeable. If they're discriminatory, we can go after them. And we have a social responsibility for, for making those kinds of policies. It's a social decision what we can, what's worth society paying for. It's not a medical decision. It's not a clinical decision. Thanks. Okay. I'd like to ask you <clears throat> about what I'll call the vacuum problem. So. Uh, you're right, right, and I agree with you that the courts are not the best place, you know, to, to make law on these. In fact, I think the courts agree with you as well. So many times they say they might decide this precise case before them on the facts, but they'll say we're 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 here to interpret the law, not to make the law. We're not going to legislate from the bench. Um, we'll defer to the elected branch. Unfortunately, this is political dynamite, and the elected branch is not going to touch it either, right? And it hasn't, and that's why in Canada and the United States. Right? We have no guidance from the courts, neither do we have guidance from the legislatures. So my question is, um, how can we get the legislature to, to uh, how can we take your proposal to our legislatures? I guess I'm, I want to take it, your proposal and make it, ask you to fill in a concrete step there or, or the action step. Um, and then you, I think you use the metaphor in response to the first question about be ready when the window opens. Do you have a sense like is that is the window might open in the next five years? I mean, how long? Um, because be, well, because my suspicion is looking to the past is that the window has been shut and perhaps even nailed shut for for quite a long time. And so then my question also is, if there's no imminent prospect that we're going to be able that the window is going to open, we're going to be able to take your proposal to our legislature. Should the medical profession in the meantime create some sort of uh, temporary stopgap? mechanisms um, because it might be so, quite some time before we're going to have um, what you've outlined for us. Sure, yeah. Um, the answer to the question of when the windows are going to open is going to depend enormously on each jurisdiction and I can't, I, I don't have any sense of other countries. Even across Canada I couldn't answer it because for us it'll happen at a provincial by provincial uh, level. So my inclination is to say, go back home and, and, and get the read of the land and whether you think you can, can get anything to happen. Still do the work so you're ready, but then you may, you may, once you've done that work, in case something happens, you say, okay, now that's all ready, but now nothing's going to happen, so I need to do something else, and that's, that's fair enough. I think one reason why legislation, you, you said this is political dynamite. I, I wonder whether partly why legislatures don't go down this path is not because they see it as political dynamite, but that they don't understand what the issue is, first off, that there's an issue, and second, what the issue is. Because they're totally scared of assisted dying, but this isn't that. Um, and I also think that partly why they won't go near it is because healthcare providers on the whole, physicians especially, certainly where, where I come from, are very opposed to this approach. So they're not necessarily unhappy with the status quo. So legislatures aren't getting pressure from the healthcare providers to legislate. So if healthcare providers could come together, if all the groups who are involved come, could, who are affected by this could come together and say, we think that this is how it should be and we think there should be legislation, then I think they'd be much more likely to want to go down that path. They're not going to want to have a fight with the docs. So it's not the end of life aspect that makes it political, it's fighting with docs about legislation. So if you could get that lined up, you probably uh, would stand a better chance of um, getting law reform. You also have to be opportunistic. Watch for when the consent legislation's being reopened or the guardianship legislation's being reopened for some other reason, and then get in the door. Right. So you're not, make, you're not going to them and saying, I want an act on unilateral withholding withdrawal. Like, you know, it's, it's not going to be the act for stopping. It, it, it's going to be in your guardianship or in your consent or somewhere. 
And so uh, that, that's probably partly also why legislatures are often so reluctant to open up guardianship and consent legislation, because they know that everybody's waiting there to go pounce with their specific issue that fits within that legislation. But they do come open, so you can be ready for that. Um, and you know, the final point of, well, what happens if it's just not looking like it's going to happen? What, what do we do? I absolutely think we, we should be trying to get together as legal, ethical, medical, nursing, all the communities to say, OK, well, what, what are the best policies for our institutions? So I don't think it's ideal. But I think in the meantime, you for sure should have a policy in your institution uh, that colleges of physicians and surgeons should have position statements. But those, what they can do is um, not do all the pieces that some legislation can do. But what I would want them to be doing is making it very clear. Follow um, that you, you must disclose and have conversations. You have to have a conflict resolution process. But when you ultimately have intractable conflict, you go to court and state the doctors do not have the authority to unilaterally withhold and withdraw through institutions, through colleges of physicians, the regulators, and so on, have that. And then, and then we'll have to go to court, and courts will have to uh, deal with it. And eventually, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada could have dealt with, could have fixed it for us. But they had the out of answering it by, because there was legislation. So you always take the narrowest view you can and answer in court the interpretation of legislation. So they did that. But we could well get another case, and that's what we should do in the meantime, too. It's just we try to get the perfect case to go up where it has no legislation so that they have to deal with the common law <laughs> and figure it out for us. But that's another five years. Um, in palliative care and nursing, there's sometimes a tension when families have to come from interstate um, for the person who's dying. And they don't have a lot of time to waste on the dying process. So when you talk about shifting decision-making power and things like that, would that include um, giving families the decision-making power too to say, well, you know, we don't want this to continue ad nauseum. Um, we're happy to give it a week because we have to go back to our lives. Right. I do believe that the patient or their substitute decision maker should have the, dis the authority to make the decision about requesting treatment or uh, stopping treatment, but that doesn't mean they're unchallengeable either, right? So this is all just a, who's your first person with authority, and that authority is always challengeable. So in your circumstance, as a healthcare provider, somebody's coming in and you've got the impression they're really just wanting to get back out of state, they're not acting according to the wishes of the individual or in the best interest of the individual, you can challenge that. So you should be able to, under under this legislation that I would see, or any legislation that's around substitute decision making, absolutely be able to challenge that on the basis that they are not fulfilling their obligation. So in Ontario, where we have that legislation that provides for the consent and capacity board, for instance, it's very clear the process, either way the decision's going, whether it's a refusal or not. If you think the substitute decision maker is not acting in accordance with interest, best, uh, wishes and then best interests, you challenge them and they can be removed. Yeah, so there is a protection for that. I can understand uh, this process as an intellectual thing to try to correct the law, but as a clinician who has these sort of conversations every day, it's hard to see what the actual problem is it's trying to fix. Because from the start of this conference, it seems to me the common things are that people are getting resuscitation at the end of their life that they don't want, and generally they're getting care that they don't want. And the number of population who are facing that is getting greater and greater. The problem with this is in this aspect of defining what's necessary for life and things that may or may not work or will or will not work and what the percentages are. And most of these conversations happen on the weekends, late at night with junior doctors, etc. And the problem you're potentially going to produce is you have those doctors having conversations with families about what out of this large menu of possible things that might work would you like to have done for your family? And that leads to an increased number of people who are going to have treatment they never wanted ordered by their family who don't want to make that decision. So I think this is a problem, this is a legislation approach that addresses a legal issue but does not little to actually solve the real problem in the community of people having treatment that they didn't want that yeah. wasn't really indicated because it solves a legal issue as opposed to a real clinical problem and it focuses on the 1% and ignores the 99%. So there's a couple of things to say back. Um, the, the first is that I think it is a very real clinical problem. There are actual cases of people who 
uh, have treatment withheld or withdrawn from a loved one that where they believe that treatment is appropriate uh, without them being told or if they are told uh, against their wishes. That is deeply problematic. Uh, so it is not, it is, it's, it's probably in your 5%, not 1%, but 5 because that's your intractable conflict over whether or not to provide. So I think it, it, we see these cases, they are very damaging to all who are involved. And uh, so it's a real problem. I think an interesting cross-cultural thing that's going on though is that Australia and the UK seem to be wrestling more with a question of uh, when you can stop treatment when the person doesn't even want it. It's taken longer to get to a position where we are, which is if you don't want treatment, if you refuse treatment, your substitute decision maker refuses treatment, those healthcare providers cannot treat you. Right? But that's still in a way being wrestled with here and in the UK. What are the limits on when somebody can refuse treatment? And so, so the value of this, this notion, the value of life is given much greater weight, it seems, in Australia and New Zealand and the UK than in North America where autonomy has trumped that. So we're not, we're addressing this issue, the unilateral withholding withdrawal, in the context of clarity and a very strong autonomy-based approach to refusals of treatment. So we don't have that same sense of there are all these people who are getting treatment that they don't want. That, so you're not sort of worried, oh, if we go down this path, will we end up with more people getting treatment they don't want? Because that, that's not a part of our reality. So I think it's an interesting question about um, someone coming from a different context and then trying to lay out something that has to do with Australian law with your context. I take great comfort and we'll blame. Uh, th this is, no, but this is precisely why I worked with Ben and Lindy on this because it would be utterly presumptuous to come here, make a proposal about Australian law be because of a, an incapacity to understand that cultural, you can read about it, but it just doesn't, it, it doesn't get through. Now I can, I can articulate what the distinction is now, but that's only through having worked through this with them to come to understand the contextual difference. So, so that is to say, I think that needs to nuance where we are. And I think it, it explains why you might have a fear of it. I don't share that fear that you're going to be having people get treatment that they don't want. You're going to have treatment being forced, healthcare providers being compelled to provide treatment they don't want to provide. That's the real reality that you've got to come to grips with and be prepared for. I think what the actuality is with most conversations is, that, and I think conversations are very valuable, is that clinicians have a discussion with a family and they offer them a range of treatments that they think they might reasonably provide. There are a whole range of treatments which probably have got a low chance of success which don't get offered. Uh, when those conversations are held by people who don't feel as clinically comfortable with having those discussions, they offer a whole range of treatments which may not be clinically indicated for the family to make a choice. And then that's when that's a problem. So I think it's not so much that the, the conversation should occur and you have what you might call a consenting conversation, but it's not about offering them all these range of options that may or may not work, I'm not quite sure. You have a conversation about where, you, where you're up to and perhaps what the goals of treatment should be and the vast majority of those, they agree with you. It, but it, that is different to having a conversation, these are all the possible things that might work, which ones of those do you want today? Yeah, and that's not really a, right. you might say that's unilateral or not, but that's, that's where the actual practicality of it is. And those conversations are the ones that happen every day in the acute phase. And, right. and I guess the problem with law like this is that it has some particular cases in mind, but it doesn't deal with every elderly person who comes to a hospital who's gonna have a fairly usually straightforward discussion with their relatives about what are the possible things that might be done and might not be. But it's not based in offering them a whole range of things that possibly could work. And so I guess that's the... Yeah. I mean, one, one thing to say is that's a caricature of the position. So I'm not saying a doctor would walk in and say, there are, here are the 7,000 things that might work. Please tell me what you want. That, that's not what's being presented. But what I'm saying is you can't hold back telling about some things because you believe them not to be worth doing. Or you can't cloak it in what, what, what reasonably provide. I'll tell you about what I would reasonably provide. Because you have to recognize what's inside reasonably provide are all kinds of assumptions uh, about, for instance, disability, about culture. And when you see the cases that blow up, 
That's where you really can see how much is buried in those cases that don't actually ever turn into conflict, in part because people don't realize they can challenge and so on, but they're there. And we should be paying attention to that. We should recognize the fact that, that disability is viewed in a particular way, particular ways within the healthcare profession that is not shared by many in various communities of persons with disabilities. And what, you, what, what the healthcare team will think it's reasonable to provide is not what those individuals would think is reasonable to provide or to, it's we're actually talking about withholding. And so we have to unpack and it's only by saying you have to talk about these things that we will be able to ensure that the biases that are inherent in all of us do not um, inform, narrow the options that are given to people under the guise of a reasonableness standard. Because that is, that's a biased standard, right? That's a standard of, I mean, even just look around this room. We're not representative. So we have to be very careful about that. So this kind of move is designed to uh, surface those issues, to protect people from having those um, treatments and opportunities withheld or withdrawn because of uh, these kinds of biases. And it doesn't turn the world upside down. I mean, one of the things is the Consent and Capacity Board in Ontario has been running for 17 years. Uh, healthcare providers are not finding themselves that it has not had this horrifying effect that doctors now need to sit down and lay out the 7,000 possible things that might work, you know, the way, the way you describe. It hasn't had that impact on the clinical relationships. So it's really actually important to look at that and say, what is the impact of it? And what it's done is it's empowered a, a, some small number of people to make sure they could, they, that, that if the fight is intractable, and you, you have to go through the process of conflict resolution and so on, and so it's a small number that are intractable. But what, that, what it does is it says at the end of the day, if the fight is intractable, if the conflict is intractable, the doctor has to go to the consent and capacity board. They have the onus to go and seek, seek that review. And it's a small number of cases. It empowers people, and away you go. Um, I have to actually agree with the previous uh, questioner as a fellow clinician that what we see in the hospitals already shows that there's a balance towards people receiving treatment that the doctors would contest is not appropriate clinically. And it's usually because here in the setting we have in Australia, a lot of doctors still think they need to provide a treatment because uh, the patient, or more frequently, the substitute decision maker is demanding it. Um, having said that, a lot of us in Australia think, thank goodness we don't work in North America, which where we actually think it's a lot, the, the power balance is actually in the wrong direction. I mean, for me to work in the state of New York where you have to provide CPR unless, according to the statute there, the patient or the family um, sign a, a, a consent to not provide CPR is a complete nonsense. Yep. A lot of people end up receiving CPR where everyone, you know, a blind man riding past on a horse would tell you that CPR was not indicated in that sort of setting. So given that you're wanting to change the legislation for a very small number of people, and yet we know that, by and large, people are actually receiving treatment that is not going to help them, or that they would not have wanted if they'd been able to speak up. Um, makes me wonder if it's actually the best solution, and maybe the better solution, given the difficulty in changing legislation, would be education. Education about the public in terms of their rights, and education about, uh, of doctors and nurses <coughs> about what the legislation currently applies. And if you're concerned about people not having a right to have a say, there are plenty of cases where um, patients or families have asked for a, uh, a Supreme Court injunction until that can be resolved. So I think the current legislation still allows that interplay of, um, of decision making. Yeah, I, th I think the current legal status so sets you up for the very, the very circumstance you described, which is people getting treatment that, in fact, they don't, they don't even want or isn't appropriate because there's so much confusion. I've tried to figure out the law here in Australia and it, it is, um, it, it's messy. I won't say it's a mess, it's messy in many places. And so how are healthcare providers to understand what the law is if it's very difficult? And they, the, the work just came out this week shows that, that they don't understand it. So a lot of what's happening is not treatment that would be compelled under the regime I'm 
advocating for. It's treatment that's being provided because there's a lack of clarity about what the law is. People don't understand. People don't know what their rights are and so on. So yes, you, you, you need to address all of that. But when you introduce legislation like this, what you're doing is you're saying, let's get clear about this. And then when the law is clear, you can educate. It's very difficult to educate when it's very unclear. You don't think it's uneven. clear across Australia about no. the approach uniformly apart from Queensland? Because that's what you actually no, presented. No, I think, I, think, I think you can still, I think that there's, and this is why you're going to continue having cases, you're going to have pressure on questions like what, what is the necessary of life? What are the lawful excuses? Um, what's the role of good medical practice in this? So you're going to have to get, you're getting the details of it figured out. What's futility? You're going to you get the details of it figured out through litigation, which is a very corrosive way to get clarity in the, for, the, for the provision of health care. Because it's piece by piece by piece. It's put together the cases that say, oh, well, there's a case over in that state and there's a case here. It's not determinative, but let's, you know, oh, let's look to the UK. You know, what's going on? So having a legislative regime will give you clarity that will prevent some of the overtreatment that you're talking about, as well as giving the uh, opportunity for those who would be denied treatment uh, in the circumstances that I'm suggesting are inappropriate. Um, from ha get, gaining access to, 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 to a review of that conflict. It is, not, it is not a trump for the family. That's not what I'm arguing for. It is because, because they can be overturned by the tribunal. My other question is about the practicalities. You said you didn't think that the ICUs would become overwhelmed. And that, right. that, but I, I'd like to know what evidence you have to support that because one of my concerns would, would be that you'd get paralysis. Right. And there would be all these delays. Yeah. And, and then my third question about the practicalities. I think we'll have to stop at just that last question. Is, yep, is, a, is about the fact that you said if suddenly people wanting a whole lot of crazy things. Um, let me rephrase that because that sounds biased. Hey. Um, people were asking for things that may not be um, uh, sustainable from a distributive justice perspective. Yep. For example, you might have people wanting lung transplants where it's really not going to help. And despite the fact that lung transplant physicians say this will, you know, this won't help you and, and quality of life and so on, but they still want it. Or someone still wants to sure. be on a, an external heart pump or on dialysis. And you say, well, in the end, society would have to make that decision and say, we can't sustain this. But the lack of momentum of society to come forward and actually make that decision while the momentum of the individual challenging it would be that suddenly our health budget in Australia would be like right. America's and God forbid that. Yeah. Your, incentive, your, your incentive to develop institutional policies will increase dramatically if you have to, under, if you had a regime like this because you would have to have resource allocation policies. I am absolutely saying you can deny treatment on the basis of resource allocation. Absolutely, a distributive justice move. You just can't do it at the bedside in a way that is not challengeable, invisible. We have to have accountability for it. So it can happen at the institutional level and the legislative level. So absolutely, there would be policies restricting. So that's why it doesn't explode, because you can't have access to everything. And the evidence, in terms of the evidence that it doesn't happen, you, you look at jurisdictions that have said, no, in fact, doctors do not have the authority unilaterally. So for instance, Ontario. And the evidence, yeah, the evidence is there. That is what I would point you to is, is Ontario. And I absolutely am not advocating the New York approach at all. That's not what was in there. Um, and so it is, it, it, it's a, an approach saying you move the decision-making authority, you establish a challenge regime so that, and then you have institutional policies and legislative policies around allocation of resources. So we have to stop. Mm -hmm.